It's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to come and be a part of this meeting. Uh, we're grateful for the invitation from Brother Micah asking us to come to be uh, to take part in these services. And I'd ask you to pray for us that the will of God would be done in us in these days. Appreciate that song. That is one of my favorites. I don't know how it gets much better than Victory in Jesus. I had a man I used to work for years ago that said, uh, always would tell me, Brother Toby, I want you to preach my funeral when I'm gone. And he said, now what I want you to do is first sing Amazing Grace and then sing Victory in Jesus. And he says, if anything else is left to be said that wasn't said in one of those two songs, then you just have at it. But uh, those two just about say it all. And I thank the Lord for it. That uh, Victory in Jesus was written by Mr. E.M. Bartlett one of the great songwriters ever, and that's probably his greatest song. He's also well known for having written the little Jimmy Dickens song, Take a Cold Tater and Wait. So he was a diversified, gifted man in his songwriting, but uh, I'll, I think he did a little better on that victory in Jesus than he did on that cold tater song. Um, but what a, what a wonderful song. We enjoyed the choir singing tonight. Thank you for that I appreciate it. I don't get to sing or get to listen to the choir very much. I sing and uh, try to direct the choir to the church where I pastor. I've had different choir directors. They keep getting called to preach and the next thing you know somebody wants them to come pastor. And uh, then they take my pianists and my singers with them when they go. And uh, last one I told them, I said, now you can go but you're going to have to leave your wife and kids here. But that didn't work out very well. And so I'm back to leading the choir again, and I don't hear well anyway, so then when I'm trying to sing with them, I don't hear, hardly hear them singing. I got to sit tonight and listen to the choir sitting, standing behind me and singing, and that was a blessing, and I want to thank you for it. Let's look in the Word of the Lord tonight in the book of John, the Gospel according to St. John, in chapter number 1. Of the great chapters of the Word of the Lord, and uh, maybe, maybe the most consequential verse in the entire Bible outside of John 3.16 is found in this chapter of the Word of the Lord. I hope and pray that you'll give me your undivided attention for a little while as we try to share what the Lord has laid on our hearts. And I hope and pray that it'll be a blessing to you and that you pray for us that God would use us, use us. Pray for your own soul tonight that the Lord would give you anointing to hear the word of the Lord as much as what he gives us anointing to preach and declare the unsearchable riches of Christ. If you found your place in John chapter 1 and if you are able and willing I would invite you to stand with us and we'll reverence the reading of the word of the Lord. John chapter 1 and I'll try to preach on Georgia time tonight but you pray for us around home. I grew up in a little church in the pine thicket and they called it the preaching hour. And they believed that it really was. Matter of fact, they said they didn't really believe you were a real preacher until you could preach. They didn't think you had to preach an hour every time. But until you could preach an hour, they didn't think you was a real preacher. You was just an exhorter. And the old timers around there would say something like this, I hear tell you're making a preacher. And if you were making a preacher, that meant you were getting closer and closer to preaching an hour. And if you'll call home and check on me in Bremen, Georgia tonight, you'll find out if that's the definition that I've made a preacher. But you pray that the Lord would help us to preach on Georgia time this evening. John chapter 1 beginning in verse 19, the word of the Lord says, And this is the record of John, when, G when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed. I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. When they say unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us, What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees, and they asked him, and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not the Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there is one standing among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. 
These things were done in Beth Arba beyond Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After, he come, after me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not. But he, that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. And again the next day, there are three days here, all three days. Now he does the same thing. He points to Jesus. And again the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus, as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. You can be seated tonight. Thank you graciously for standing with us while we read the word of the Lord. I want to take our text tonight, especially from verse number 29, where John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus coming unto him, says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And again in verse number 36, when he says unto his disciples, The next day, Behold the Lamb of God. That really is the purpose of all of our preaching if we are to be men of God tonight is to point people unto Jesus, to see Him, not to see us. We often pray for the Lord to hide us behind the cross. That is, that, that men may see the Lord, Jesus, and Him crucified, buried, and risen, and coming again. For we are nothing and he's everything. We must decrease and he must increase. We are but voices and vessels for the Lord to use, but he is really all that matters. And they asked John in these days, said, what do you have to say of yourself? Are you that prophet? Are you that uh, Messiah? Are you that one to come? And he told him unexplicably, I am not that one. I'm just a voice. I'm nobody. I'm not even worthy to kneel down and unloose his shoes. There's one that was before me and he's coming after me and uh, said, I'm pointing me in unto him. And he stood right in the midst of you and you don't know who he is. Matter of fact, John said, I didn't know who he was. Twice John said, I didn't know him. I knew him not, he said in verse 31. Again, down in verse 33, and I knew him not. But the Lord revealed him unto John. And he did so through the Holy Ghost. And he said, the one that you see the Holy Spirit descending and remaining on him, then that is the Son of God. And the Holy Spirit came and descended, remained on him. And the Lord God of heaven pointed out who Jesus was through the moving of the Holy Spirit. May I say he operates in the same way in this day and hour that the reason I know who Jesus is is through the operation of the Holy Spirit that he revealed him unto my heart, made him known unto me that I may be known of him, have made him known unto me that I might receive him and the sacrifice of the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's remarkable how that it seems that man has not noticed him or not known him or not received him or not uh, have not paid attention to who he is. I heard a preacher a few weeks ago telling about back in the 1980s flying into Jerusalem after being up all night with very little sleep overnight flight and so forth. He's leading a tour into that city and he said he was getting a little rest on the bus on the way to a hotel when he glanced over to his right side and noticed that they were no more than about a thousand feet away from the hill of 
Golgotha. And there's a large city bus depot there. And the car horns were blaring and diesel smoke was rising. And the stress of afternoon traffic filled the air. It was as if men were all over the place where the Lamb of God paid for man's sin. But men were running to and fro, living life, going and doing, but without recognizing the redemption mountain set right in their midst. It was as if it were hidden while it was in plain sight. It sat right beside them. But he said, it just captivated me when I looked to the right and to the left and saw one driving and talking on the phone and another one fussing at the traffic and another one yelling at kids in the back seat and some seemed stressed and some were listening to the radio and patting their hands. And he said, I wonder how many of them realize at the shadow of the place where we see it. How many of them recognize what happened right here in our midst? Oh, it was much that way in the days of John the Baptist. Oh, my friend, they were uh, right in the midst of the Lord Jesus Christ. In our text, there were crowds that came out to see John, but he gloried in nothing concerning himself. Oh, in verse number 22, they said unto him, I said, Who art thou that we may give an answer unto them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? And yet he said nothing, nothing of himself. He said, I'm a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. I didn't come to declare unto you anything about myself. There's nothing important to tell about myself. But praise God for the day I met him, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. If I come to, to declare anything to you tonight of Toby Powers, then it will be nothing more important than a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. It'll be nothing more than just racket. But praise the Lord, if I can tell you about him tonight, it holds eternal importance. And John said, I must tell you about the Lord. It's not about my credentials. It is not about my claims. It's not about my abilities or my crime. But rather it is about the Lord Jesus Christ. He said it like this. Instead of telling you about myself, let me tell you there's one coming after me. Let me tell you there's one that was preferred before for me and he was before me let me tell you about this I'm not even worthy to bow down and take his shoes off and he said that you don't even know who he is he's standing among you and you don't know him but I'm going to tell you I didn't know him one time either but he said the Holy Ghost came and showed me who he was and after that I knew him and you can know him the same way that I came to know him the Holy Ghost will point out who Jesus really is is well, and to be, to make your heart to sense him and to be drawn of him and to yearn for him and to desire his work in your life and he says behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world he points to those that are lost those that had not heard the message and says behold the lamb of God and then the next day he has two of his disciples those who have heard the message those who were deeply invested in the message those who had received the message and to them the message was the same behold the Lamb of God and maybe you've come this way tonight and you've never been saved you don't know the Lord you've never met Jesus your sin problem has never been dealt with my message to you this evening is behold the Lamb of God and maybe you've come tonight and you've been saved longer than what I've been alive You've tried to live for Jesus, walk with Jesus, fellowship with Jesus. And you're wondering, what's that two before preacher from Georgia going to have to say unto me? The message is the same. Behold the Lamb of God. I don't have another message. I don't have another message for religious or irreligious, young or old, educated, uneducated, black or white. My friend, rich or poor, the message is the same. Behold the Lamb of God. Hey, friend, He's really what matters. May the Lord help us to point men unto the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the message of John in John chapter 1 and verse 29 where he says behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world is the apex the climax the fulfillment of a prophetic destiny that had been set in place from the beginning it ultimately is the story of the whole Bible the Old Testament is all about one thing and that is Jesus is on the way. Jesus is on the way. Well, from the first chapter of Genesis all the way through the end of Malachi, it's about how Jesus is on the way. And praise the Lord, the Gospels are all about how Jesus has arrived. And my friend, how he's here. And you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. And my friend, how he has arrived. It is peace on earth good will towards men behold the Lamb of God and then my friend the revelation is all about how Jesus is coming again it is the story of the Bible the story of the Lamb that Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world now Isaiah chapter 28 verse number 13 tells us that this story of the Lamb of God is a progressive revelation he said he showed it to us line upon line, line upon line precept upon precept precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, uh, when Adam and Eve were in the garden of Eden and they sinned, uh, the Lord did not just reveal all of his plan to them in one sitting, he didn't sit them down and say let me tell you about 66 books that I'm going to write and everything and every revelation that there is to be made known of God uh, but rather it was little by little, here a little and there a little uh, and God sent them prophets and preachers and he sent men unto them with a word from the Lord and holy men of old wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost and to my friend over a process of time God showed them his revelation it is the fulfillment of it all in verse 29 when he says behold the Lamb of God that is all the Lord has promised all the Lord has shown all the Lord has prophesied is fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the promise of God, but they had only received it in pieces. In the book of Genesis, the first a line upon line began to be given unto them. When he taught us the lesson that there is a lamb for a man. There is a lamb for a man. Genesis tells of the fall of mankind. And we really don't realize or recognize that the depth of man's fall. Adam did not just simply backslide from God's favor but he fell into the depths of depravity. Adam's disobedience in the garden opened the gateway of sin and the pathway to death and hell. Every evil work was given place in mankind through that disobedience in the garden. Every genocide, every abortion, every mass murder, every perversion of every sort and an entire world of sin was unleashed by Adam's fall years ago when I was but a young preacher boy. And that's getting to be longer ago than what it used to be. I watched Brother Micah tonight and I thought, I remember when I was about that age. But that's been a long time ago. And it won't be long. I probably won't even remember when I was that age. Amen. But praise God. Years and years and years back, when Adam sinned in the garden, somebody had asked me years ago, said, why was it such a big deal? All he did was eat a piece of fruit. You mean to tell me that God's so mean and so rough and so ornery that he kills somebody for eating when they're hungry? But you don't seem to understand. We don't see things the way the Lord does. You say all that Adam did was just eat a piece of fruit. Adam did as bad as he could. Adam was only given one law. All he had to do was keep one law. And he broke the one that he had. Adam sinned as bad as he could sin. He sinned as a, a my friend horrendously as what it was possible for him to sin. He 
was as disobedient as what he could be disobedient. And to my friend, the Lord set it up just exactly that way uh, so that Adam would either receive the word or reject the word. It was an either or proposition. And the book of James said if a man breaks the law in one point, he is guilty of it all. And Adam was not just that he had committed a sin, but now he's a sinner. He's a no longer as it were, my friend, in the image of his, of his sovereign, of his Lord. But now he's deformed by his sin. He don't think right. He doesn't talk right, walk right, act right because he is not right. And my friend, if God does not work a miracle for him, there is no hope for Adam. Well, my friend, in his worldwide effort for man to redeem himself, restore himself, and cover his own sin was established. Adam did this by picking fig leaves and sewing them together to cover his nakedness. Oh, my friend and men have tried with every conceivable manner to cover their own sin. Oh, my friend, but God showed us line upon line and precept upon precept how that there was a lamb for a man and his works could not overcome his sin. His abilities, his desire, his effort could not hide his nakedness. But praise God, the Lord slew an animal and took the skins of that animal and covered, my friend, the nakedness of Adam and his wife Eve. And this was the beginning of God pointing to a time when a sacrifice would deal with man's sin problem. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Well, but that sacrifice, a lamb for a man, that's the principle. There was animals slain for Adam and for his wife Eve. But my friend, that, that would begin to really be revealed truly unto Adam and his family when through the process of time Cain and Abel would come to realize my friend, that the sacrifice for mom and dad as it were for mom and dad would not be adequate for them but they would have to receive for themselves the lamb for a man oh my friend and Cain and Abel came to understand this and they also offered before the Lord Cain gave of the process of his garden the produce the fruit of the ground but Abel gave of a slain lamb and God had respect unto Abel's offerings and many scholars believe when the Bible says God had respect unto, unto Abel's offerings that that would have meant that God had received by fire the offering that, uh, that Abel gave unto him the same way that he did in the tabernacle and the temple years later. Uh, the same way that he did on the mountain uh, for Elijah when the Lord uh, had Elijah build the altar and prayed and he consumed it by fire. Uh, that is the Lord received it. The Lord is a consuming fire. I don't know if that's right or not but that's what the pointy headed intellectuals seem to think. Uh, and there is a great picture in it. Uh, I mean Abel gives this lamb unto the Lord and then God has respect unto it. If that does mean that he's received it by fire can you imagine standing there after maybe lightning has struck from heaven a smoke to that altar burned up the sacrifice there's smoldering fire and my friend there is a flame and there is smoke coming forth from that altar and Abel stands there trembling looks upon that little lamb that's been burned and he realizes the fire would have been on him had it not been that the Lord received his lamb. Oh, hear me, friend. It'll strike you. I'm down in your soul when you realize how the hell's fire waited for us had our lamb not taken our place. Had God not received his sacrifice, we'd all been hell bound. But praise God, I heard, I've heard of a place somewhere below where that men talk and read about 
They say the fire. They say that men, when they go, can never come back out. It's a place of torment for lost souls who've turned the Lord away. They say the fire burns all night because there is no day. But I've escaped that awful place when Jesus saved my soul, and not one hair upon my head will into that place go. No, I don't have to worry. For the Savior took my part. The only fire I'll ever feel is burning in my heart. Praise God that he received the lamb. He received that sacrifice. He received one upon whom he was well pleased. And my friend, that lamb would be the type that would be in the heart and the mind of men as he would approach the altar time and time and time again. He would serve as the picture of the one that would come. The type until the anti-type would come. Until the fulfillment would come. Until John 1 and 29 would come. Oh my friend, the offering of a lamb for man is the only answer that he has. Oh my. This principle was real in the lives of Abraham or in the real in the lives of Adam and Eve. It real it revealed in the lives of Cain and Abel. And then, my friend, it was reinforced in the person of Abraham as the Lord calls him out of Ur of the Chaldees in Genesis 12. And my friend, he's called out of a land of idolatry, called out of a land of, of, of awful worship of idols and child sacrifice. The Bible tells tells us that Abraham's father was an idolater. He worshipped the false gods of that land. Oh my, my, my. The Bible said that he called out Abram. His name means exalted father. And then later on changed to Abraham, the father of many multitudes. Out of Ur, the land of the moon god, of the Chaldees. And he heard the voice of the Lord. And he was called out of that land of idols, the land of heathenism, the land of false worship the land of his father's sin to follow after the Lord and God would tell him in days to come to take that miracle son of his and that boy Isaac that was the promised seed born unto he and Sarah in their old age and to offer his boy unto the Lord on the altar at the top of Mount Moriah all of that Abraham had known in his life growing up was the world of idolatry the world of of human sacrifice, the world of little babies being offered on the fiery arms of demon gods, little children screaming while the heathen priests would beat the drums of their altars and their ceremonies to drown out the cries of babies who were offered in the fire. It was repugnant to God, and my friend could never take away the sin of man, but God must show them this to Abraham that his previous way was not right. God must show to Abraham that the way of his fathers wouldn't be right. God must turn him. That's what repentance is. It is being turned to the Lord from yourself, from your past, from your habits unto God. And the Lord would use this to turn Abraham. Oh my friend, so God sent him to the mountain with Isaac. He took Isaac, the fire, the wood, the donkeys, but Isaac asked his father, where is, the, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Oh, Abraham says, God will provide himself a lamb for the offering. We cannot imagine the temptation that must have gone through Abraham's mind while he's going up that mountain. How that he must have thought, Lord, this can't be right. That's what those heathens were doing back in Ur, offering their children. Surely you're not wanting me to do this but Lord I trust you and Romans said that against hope he believed in hope he believed that if he laid him down on the altar that God was able to raise him from the dead oh hallelujah hallelujah he learned to trust in the redeeming blood and in the resurrection in one occasion on that blessed mountain that day oh praise the God of heaven every one of Abraham's friends back in the land of Ur who had brought their babies and down to the place of idolatry and had given them to a heathen priest and placed them as sacrifices on the altar to some false